Welcome to this online lesson asking the question, how should Oliver Cromwell be remembered? A brave but bad man or something else entirely? Today's aims are to know who Oliver Cromwell was, to analyse his actions as Lord Protector and to evaluate interpretations of Cromwell. Pause the video now while you note down today's title. Press play when you're ready to continue. All right, let's have a look at some key words and terms. In Cloak's compendium of annoying old-fashioned words that you need to know are Lord Protector, Cromwell's title as ruler. He was not a king, even though he was at one point offered the crown. Two, genocide, the killing of a group of people because of who they are, for example, for their race or their religion, etc. Number three, regicide, killing a king. Number four, dictator, a ruler who has complete power and control over a country. They make all the decisions about how it is run. Probably the most famous historical example of this would be Adolf Hitler, although there are plenty of others too. Here are your tasks then. Firstly, record the key terms and their meanings. Secondly, did Cromwell commit regicide? Have a think about what you might already have learnt about the death of Charles I. And then thirdly, why might Cromwell not have wanted to be called king? Pause the video now and then press play when you're ready to continue. Alright, hopefully you got all those key terms down. So did Cromwell commit regicide? Well, he didn't exactly swing the axe himself, but many people see him as one of the key people involved in the regicide or killing of Charles I. After all, his name did appear on the death warrant, and many people see him as the driving force behind securing the king's execution. So why might Cromwell not have wanted to be called king? Well, don't forget that Cromwell has just led the armies in a civil war fighting to get rid of the king, or at the very least for many people to reduce his power. For Cromwell to then make himself king would be incredibly hypocritical. Cromwell recognised this, but it didn't stop him ruling like a king. We're going to have a look at one of my favourite historical sources now. It's known as the world turned upside down. What was England like without a king? Well, for some people, when Charles I was being executed and when Cromwell and Crom Parliament were increasing their power, it was as if the entire world that they had always known had completely transformed. And so this woodcut cartoon was produced in these years, which was trying to communicate just how crazy things appeared. Look at the caption at the top. By TJ, presumably this person wanted to remain anonymous. A well-willer to the king, parliament and kingdom. So this person seems not to be actually taking, taking sides. Anyway, what craziness is going on in this picture? Here are some follow-up tasks. Firstly, list all the things that are wrong or upside down in the picture. Then secondly, what do you think the artist was trying to say about the state of the country and how it was being run after the execution of Charles I? Pause the video here while you do those tasks. Well, you've probably noticed that there is an eel and a fish swimming in the sky. Obviously, normally they'd be in the sea. There's a candle burning downwards, the opposite to what really happens, and a church upside down in the sky. More um, hilariously, or at least in the context of when this was produced, we've got a man who's wearing his trousers on his arms and his boots on his hands. He's wearing his jacket on his legs and his gloves on his feet, all upside down. But it goes further than that. His eyes are where his ears should be, and his ears are where his eyes should be. It's all gone completely wrong. He's got a beard on his head, and he's got his hair on his face. We've got a horse which is pushing a cart instead of pulling it. We've got a rat that chase, that's chasing a cat. And we've got a rabbit that's chasing a fox. Yes, that's not a particularly good picture of a fox, but it's what it's meant to be. And lastly, we have a wheelbarrow pushing a man. So what is this trying to say? Well, it's trying to say that the whole country is in a state of complete and utter chaos. Everything's confusing and nobody really recognises what's going on. Perhaps this person is trying to claim that at least under the king there was a sense of stability, but now everything's changed, and perhaps they weren't quite as good as Parliament would like them to think. The Commonwealth of England, Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans. Create a subheading now. One of the leading politicians after the death of Charles I was a man called Praise God Barebone. Yes, that's his actual name, but you've not seen anything yet there is a picture of him. He had a brother called Fear God Barebone. And he had a son called, I'm going to need a deep breath, breath for this one. If Jesus Christ had not died for thee, thou hadst been damned Barebone. 
but he preferred the name Nicholas for some reason. What might this tell us about how England might be ruled after Charles I was killed? Consider that question, note down an answer, and then press play when you're ready to continue. Well, probably you've identified that these people are religious extremists. Yes, they are taking their Puritan religion so seriously, they are calling their children, if Jesus Christ has not died for thee, thou hadst been damned, barebone. What a ridiculous name in the modern, uh, by modern terms. But this gives us an idea of just what an extremist Protestant and Puritan religion was being followed in England at this time, supported by the likes of Oliver Cromwell. We're going to consider now the different groups that were trying to rule England at this time. How should England be governed? One of the first groups was known as the Diggers. These were their main beliefs. No one branch of mankind, which means one type of person, should rule another. God made the land for everyone. It is not just to be owned by the rich. And a group of diggers actually occupied the land at St George's Hill in Surrey. They said if everyone did this, it would end hunger and poverty. You might say that their slogan was, share out the land. Make some notes on the diggers now. You'll need those for the next task. Press play when you're ready to continue. Our next group were known as the levellers. This is one of the more famous groups. They believed that Parliament was to run the country, rather than the King. MPs to be voted in by all men over 21. Yes, all men, no women, sorry about that. They believed in trial by jury, and the freedom of worship, you could choose your religion. And they believed that the death penalty should be reserved only for the crime of murder. For the time, this was quite progressive. The Levellers had a great deal of support amongst the soldiers of the New Model Army, who felt that these were the ideals that they had been fighting for. They were very powerful at this time, and this worried the government. You might say that their slogan was power to the people. Pause the video while you make some notes on the levellers. Thirdly, we have the group known as the Fifth Monarchists. Okay, these are kind of the re religious extremists of the group here. Uh, Bear the Barebones family, they were all Fifth Monarchists, so might, that might give you an idea. The fifth monarchists disliked the gentry and re refused to take their hats off or bow to those higher up in society, which again was quite rebellious at the time. They did not want elected MPs. Instead, they wanted religious people to run the country. They wanted to change the legal system, people to work for people they stole for, uh, from rather than be hanged. They believed that Christ was about to return to earth and they wanted to make it a nice place for him to visit. Basically, get ready for Jesus. Pause the video here while you make some notes on the fifth monarchists and then we'll move on to our final group. Lastly, let's have a look at the role of women. Women had very little power in society at this time and many wanted to change this. All of the other groups were led by men, but in 1649 a group of women petitioned Parliament. They said, We desire a share in the freedoms of this state. Have we not an equal interest with the men of this nation? Are our lives, rights and goods to be taken from us more than men? And can you imagine us so stupid as to not see when our rights are daily broken down? Equal rights for women. Okay, pause the video and make some notes on women. Let's do a follow-up task based upon that. For this task, you might need to flip back to an earlier part of the video to review the information. But if your notes are good enough, you should be absolutely fine. Let's imagine that you are a well-off MP helping to run the country. Firstly, which group would you see as the greatest threat to England? Use this writing frame to help you structure your answer. The group that troubles me the most is... because... another reason why they worry me is... and so forth. So yes, we're writing this in the first, first person as if we are an actual MP doing it. Pause the video here and then press play when you're ready to continue. Well, whichever group you chose, Cromwell was ultimately in charge. So let's have a look at what he did to govern the country. Interpretations of Cromwell. There are two main views as to how Cromwell ruled the country. An interpretation of the past is when a historian forms an opinion of the past based upon evidence. Here's interpretation one. This is taken from the BBC History website and the author is unknown for this. At first, after the restoration of the monarchy, uh, this is when they decided to bring kings and queens back. It turned out to be Charles II, but more of that later. At first, after the restoration of the monarchy, Cromwell was understandably hated. 
1667, the royalist writer Edward Hyde, the first Earl of Clarendon, described Cromwell as a brave but bad man, portraying Cromwell as a genius who greatly harmed the country. For most of the 18th century, Cromwell was seen as a dictator who ruled by force. This mentions some of our key words from earlier, so if you need to refer to those again, do so. Now let's have a look at interpretation two. This is also taken from the BBC History website, only a different section of it, and again, the author is unknown. Some historians have portrayed Cromwell as the hero of democracy, who saved the country from the tyranny of Charles I. Tyranny meaning evil rule. In a BBC poll of 2002, Cromwell was placed as the third greatest Briton of all time, behind Winston Churchill and Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Earlier, in 1899, a statue was erected of Cromwell outside the Houses of Parliament. S. R. Gardner described Cromwell as the greatest ever Englishman in 1902. Clearly, some people consider Cromwell a great man. We're now going to consider what our views of these interpretations are, and here's how you're going to do it. Question number one. What is the difference between these two interpretations of Oliver Cromwell? Here, you're just going to identify what the difference is, so I've included the interpretations on screen again. Here's a writing frame to help you answer that question. Interpretation one says Cromwell was. An example or quote from the interpretation that shows this is. And then do the same for interpretation two. Interpretation two is different. It says that Cromwell was. And an example from, or quote from the source that shows this is. OK, pause the video here while you complete that task. OK, let's have a look at an example answer for that first question. You can always improve your answer with a purple pen if you need to, or in some other colour just to distinguish it from your first answer. Here's what I put as my first point. Interpretation 1 says Cromwell was a nasty ruler who did a lot of harm. An example or quote from the inter interpretation that shows this is that Cromwell was a brave but bad man and a genius who greatly harmed the country. My second point, interpretation 2, is different. It says Cromwell was a great man who established democracy in Britain. An example or quote from the interpretation that shows this is where it describes Cromwell as the greatest ever Englishman. Pause the video and make some improvements to your work now, and then we'll move on to our next investigation about Cromwell. So, let's have a look at Oliver Cromwell as Lord Protector. We should have identified these two interpretations as basically fitting these two opinions. We're going to now look for examples from Cromwell's life that support interpretation one, the idea that Cromwell was a brave but bad man, greatly harming the country. For example, he was in charge of the army and he made them kill Catholics. More on that in a moment. And on, then on the other side, we're going to have a look for support for interpretation two, the idea that Cromwell was the greatest ever Englishman. At this point, you don't need to decide for sure which side you sit on, but once we've gathered the evidence, you should have an idea of which side you more agree with. For example, for interpretation two, this is supported by examples such as like he was an excellent military commander who helped win the civil war for parliament. Create a table like this in your own work, and then when you're ready to continue, we'll have a look at some examples that you can add to your table. These will be drawn from sources and from other information within this video. Pause the video while you complete your table. Ready to see ev the evidence? Let's move on. Let's consider source A. This was not drawn in Cromwell's lifetime, but does provide us with some information. A drawing of the 1649 massacre of Catholic civilians in Drogheda, Ireland, by parliamentarian soldiers. Oliver Cromwell is pictured on a horse, watching. This source was drawn in the 1800s, some years after Cromwell had died. All right, so within this source, what examples can we see that support that Cromwell was a brave but bad man, or that Cromwell was the greatest ever Englishman? And be a bit careful with this one, as I will explain. Look closely at the source for your examples. Pause the video while you make your notes, and then I'll point out some of the things that hopefully you will have recognised. Right, one thing about this particular massacre. This is still very controversial in Ireland to this day, and absolutely right that it should be. Many people are really upset by it. It's a pretty clear cut of an example of Cromwell being an incredibly bad or even evil man. The citizens of Drogheda who was massacred were largely civilians and we can see in this picture exactly that sort of thing going on. Here is Cromwell standing aside and not acting to stop his soldiers. That's at the very best 
Other interpretations are that he didn't just allow this to happen, he pretty much commanded it to happen as well. So really, the horrible things going on in this picture are his fault. We can see the pe people who are being put to the sword here. We've got a woman who's trying to cradle her children and her baby, and they're being trampled on and they're about to be stabbed. Really horrific stuff. We can see other examples of old men as well, clearly not people of military age being killed, and even people being thrown out of buildings. This was a horrific massacre, and it's usually interpreted as being nothing more than Oliver Cromwell the Puritan persecuting Catholics for their beliefs. A really disgraceful act. So hopefully, based upon that, you've made some lots of good notes under interpretation one, that he's a brave but bad man who greatly harmed the country, and you might even question the idea that he's very brave doing this. I might remind you again, this remains a really emotive topic in Ireland, so when we're dealing with it, we need to be sensitive to that. Pause the video while you complete your notes. Let's consider further examples about conquest and colonisation in Ireland. This first map is Ireland in 1641 before Cromwell. The different shades of green represent Catholic land ownership in 1641 before Cromwell came over to Ireland and started making changes. You can see that the vast majority of what now makes up the Republic of Ireland was 50 to 100% Catholic owned land. Now let's compare that with after Cromwell. A huge difference. Yes, areas in the West remain under Catholic domination and a few areas in the North have actually expanded slightly, possibly as a result of refugees. However, what we can really tell from this is there is a huge amount of Protestant land, own land ownership because so few Catholics are now owning the land. So what can we infer from these maps? You can complete these tasks separately, but also you can use this as evidence for your table. What major change can you see between the two maps? What might have happened to the Irish Catholics by 1700 and who might live there by that time? And how might Cromwell have been responsible for these changes? Pause the video while you consider these answers. And then once you've done that, I'll outline some of the main details. So the major change that we can see is that Catholic land ownership of Ireland has decreased dramatically. Although it's increased slightly in the north, Actually, in the rest of the country, it's hugely decreased. That doesn't necessarily mean that these people have simply disappeared, but simply that they've lost their land and they no longer control it. So what might have happened to the Irish Catholics by 1700 and who might live there by that time? Well, the likelihood is that these are English settlers and English Protestant settlers. And that is exactly why the land ownership has changed. So how might Cromwell have been responsible for these changes? Well, after all, Cromwell effectively invaded Ireland with his, uh, his new model army and started persecuting the Catholics. And this provided the circumstances for English and Protestant landowners to establish their dominance over the, uh, the island of Ireland. Again, this remains hugely controversial to this day, so it's something that we really need to be sensitive to, uh, towards. And equally, if even I've made any mistakes in what I've said so far, I, I can only apologise. But this is very much how I interpret these maps. Colonisation means one country taking over another. And many historians, particularly Irish historians, would absolutely agree that this is a cast iron example of English aggressive colonisation of another country. Let's add to our table again. This is Source B, an extract adapted from the book Cromwell as a Soldier by Austin Woolrich, published in 1990. Again, look for examples that support the interpretation that Cromwell was a brave but bad man, and for support for the interpretation that he was the greatest ever Englishman. Cromwell had no formal training in military tactics. His strengths were an instinctive ability to lead and train his men, and his ability to make them follow his orders. In a war fought mostly by amateurs, and this is the English Civil War they're talking about here, these strengths were significant and likely to have contributed to the discipline of his cavalry. He kept his troops close together following fights where they were winning, rather than allowing them to chase opponents off the battlefield. This style of command was decisive, in other words, it decided who won, at both Marston Moor in 1644 and Naseby in 1645. All right, which interpretation does this one support? Pause the video and make your notes now. Hopefully we recognise that this better supports interpretation too. Although you might not think this means he's the greatest ever Englishman, it's certainly positive about his skills as a cavalry commander and how he helped decide that Parliament won the Civil War. We're going to look at some more detailed examples now. I'm going to show you a whole load of evidence about Cromwell. This is all going to be quite specific and quite detailed, so you'll want to take some time over this. 
Look carefully at each piece of evidence about Cromwell's rule in England. And if you've got your own copy of this, that's even easier because it simply means you can highlight things. If not, you might need to jot some, some ideas down. Decide whether each one suggests that Cromwell was the greatest ever Englishman, so you can highlight it in one colour, or that he was a brave but bad man who greatly harmed the country, interpretation two, highlight it in another country, uh, another colour rather. And then as a challenge, for each side, rank out of ten the strength of each piece of evidence. This will give you an idea of how important you view it. Evidence number one. Public recreations like maypole dancing, cockfighting, bear baiting and horse racing were banned with heavy punishments for doing them. Uh, the latter so-called blood sports uh, were usually uh, banned on the basis that not only were they pretty horrific and violent, but also because they encouraged gambling. Secondly, Cromwell allowed greater religious freedom for, for Protestants and invited Jewish people back to England. But notice it's only greatest religious freedom for Protestants. Thirdly, in 1652, the celebration of Christmas Day was banned because it was a Catholic excuse for drunkenness and gluttony. Cromwell could not agree with his parliaments, and he dismissed them both. Instead, he ruled the country through his major generals, which meant that England virtually became a military dictatorship. Yes, that's exactly the opposite to, what, to uh, the, the cause that many people in the Civil War were fighting for. And yeah, he's kind of ruling like a king here. Number five, Cromwell insisted that new colonies, these are countries taken over by England, could have religious freedom. Catholics were allowed to own land there. It doesn't necessarily mean that they always did. Number six, Cromwell increased the navy, which defeated the Dutch and captured Jamaica from the Spanish. Number seven, Cromwell brutally put down rebellions in Scotland and Ireland. They had reason to believe that they could rule themselves. Now there was no longer a monarch to, with the right to rule over them. Number eight, during the Scottish rebellions, the parliamentary army destroyed Dundee, killing 2,000 of the inhabitants, and they were accused of transporting many Scottish prisoners as slaves to the West Indies. Number nine, he has been accused of ethnic cleansing in Ireland. Uh, this is the idea where you try to wipe out a section of society. The massacres at Drogheda and Wexford in 1649 rank among the worst in British history, and the slaughters were followed by forced expulsions on a mass scale. Remember the different maps. Forced expulsions means people have thrown off their land or their land is simply taken off from them. Number 10, Cromwell refused a petition to make himself king, refer preferring to be Lord Protector. Number 11, gambling dens, inns and theatres were closed down, again with heavy punishments for breaking the ban. And number 12, destroyed the power of the king, for which he is sometimes referred to as the father of democracy. 13, created in Ireland a long-lasting hatred and resistance to rule from a government in London. Number 14, ended the use of illegal taxes like the ship tax. And lastly, number 15, dancing, singing and drinking was banned with heavy fines. Again, these seen as ungodly distractions. Your best bet if you don't have a copy of this is to pause the video here, make it full screen and get a screen grab of it so that you can highlight it that way. If not, like I say, you can note them down in shortened form. Pause the video here while you sort these between the greatest ever Englishman and the brave but bad man interpretations. Pause the video now. All right, let's review the evidence again. I've color coded these as you can see. The first one I've said shows that he was a brave but bad man or one that greatly harmed the country. The next I've said maybe supports the idea that he's a great Englishman and so on and so forth. You can compare this to your own highlighting or notes. And if you want to add extra evidence to your interpretations columns, now would be a good opportunity to do so. So pause the video here and make any notes that you need to and do any highlighting or corrections that you need to. Press play when you're ready to continue. Okay, let's finish off. Finally, better the devil you know. Okay, first task, which interpretation do you most agree with? Do you agree with interpretation one, that Cromwell was a brave but bad man? Or do you agree with interpretation two, that Cromwell was the greatest ever Englishman? Explain your choice using point, example, explain. This might go something like this. If you agree with interpretation one, you would write, I agree with interpretation one, that Cromwell was a brave but bad man. An example that supports this is, this supports my view because... But equally, if you agree with interpretation two, you could write, I agree with the point of view that Cromwell was the greatest ever Englishman. An example that supports my view is, this supports my view because. Pause the video while you do that task, first of all. All right, question number two. 
Overall, did getting rid of Charles I make England better or worse in the short term, in other words, during Cromwell's rule, or in the long term, as in now? Pause the video and consider your answers for that and note them down. Well, in the short term, obviously Cromwell's rule was dread for a, lot of for a lot of people, not least the Catholics and those people who were massacred in Ireland and Scotland. But for some other people, it would have been very popular. They agreed with his religious policies, no matter how horrible they were, and they were glad that the king was no longer in charge of the country. But what about in the long term? Does Queen Elizabeth II, the current monarch, actually have the same powers as Charles I? Well, the answer, of course, is no. And one of the reasons for that is Cromwell's rule and the way that uh, Charles I was removed from power. Maybe, in that case, we can see Cromwell as advancing the cause of democracy in this country, which might well be a good thing. Eventually, Charles I's son, Charles II, there he is, was invited to become King of England, which he did in 1660. Cromwell's corpse, on the other hand, was dug up and his body executed for the crime of treason. I mean, obviously they couldn't kill him twice, so this was a symbolic beheading and his head was placed on a spike. Question number three. Why might Charles II be unlikely to rule in the same way as Charles I? And four. Why do you think Cromwell's dead body was executed? And if you're squeamish, I'm just going to warn you that I'm going to show you what the head looks like now. Yuck. Not looking so good now, are you, Cromwell? Pause the video here and answer those last questions. So it's really important to realise that with Charles II, he's been invited to be king by Parliament and therefore by the people of England. He is, you might say, ruling with their permission or consent. That means that should he do anything to break that sense of goodwill and go against that permission, that permission is likely to be taken off of him and he'll be kicked out as king, or worse, just like his dad. So why was Cromwell's dead body executed? It is likely that people really resented his rule at the time, and they wanted to show their loyalty for the new king. One way of doing this was by symbolically executing Cromwell, the man who had killed the previous king. Indeed, other people who were still alive, whose names were on Charles's death warrant, also faced punishment. Pause the video here and make any necessary adjustments to your answers. All done? Well, that's our lesson on Cromwell done. I hope you found it interesting and I hope you found it useful. If you did, please like this video and subscribe to the channel for more lessons. Thanks very much for watching and goodbye.